Okay, great. So welcome again, everybody. Uh, this is uh, March 5th, and we're here talking about civil pasture and climate change. Um, if you missed our first webinar, we had one last week talking about the potential of civil pasture with myself and with Brett Chedzoy, uh, who's a farmer practicing civil pasture, one of the more established practitioners in the Northeast U.S. Um, really nice uh, series of videos. Those can be found at our website, civilpasturebook.com, under audio and video which is where this video and, and future videos will also be posted. Um, and so we're gonna to talk today specifically about the relationship of civil pasture and climate change. I wanna uh, presence where we are, at least where I am, and, and I always like to start presentations by just sort of grounding and recognizing that we are on land in a place and we're gonna be talking about uh, ways that we take care of and steward landscapes. Um, and there's a history that is inter interwoven with that, that process. Uh, and so I'm coming to you today from Cuga Nation territory. The Cuga are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. You might be more familiar with the, the name Iroquois, uh, but our, our farm is actually quite close to the border of traditional Seneca and Cuga Nation territory. And for us as farmers, it's been really important to dive into the history, which isn't um, always a pretty story. There's some really, really challenging aspects to the ways land was taken uh, here, and including the land that we're on, and we have to reckon with that uh, in our belief as as farmers, and, and really think about that. Um, and so, I encourage you to at least learn uh, whose land you you might be on uh, historically. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the slide that is a really nice map resource uh, that can connect you to that information, and and you can learn a little bit more. And I also recommend this this book as a great resource. Um, if we're in North America, if we're on land, it has a story. It has an indigenous story. Uh, really, land anywhere globally has an indigenous story. And if we're going to be stewards of the land, I think that uh, it's part of the conversation as we uh, as we move forward here. Uh, this presentation is uh, part of an effort to kind of launch our formally launch the book uh, that I've been working on for a couple of years. Eric was generous enough to offer a forward and some uh, sidebars for that book. Really appreciate that. Um, this book is uh, really, I, I saw myself as a librarian in this process, really trying to pull together the research and anecdotal information from practicing uh, farmers and homesteaders um, into one place. And I tried to frame it as a how-to guide in a way that folks could take it and walk through a design process of their own and really come out with some good strategies for their own land. So these are the chapters that are in the book. It's coming out in June. Uh, really excited. It's the second book uh, of mine. Uh, first book was Farming the Woods with Ken Mudge. That's where we focused on the agroforestry practice of, um, of forest farming. This one's civil pasture. So trees and trees and farming is, is the practice of agroforestry, and I have a lot of interest in all kind of aspects and kind of working our way through those as we go. I'll uh, also give a quick pitch for our Kickstarter. Uh, we're offering these webinars to help bring awareness to this. Um, this is running through mid-May, and uh, luckily last week, a generous anonymous donor was uh, stepped forward and um, offered to match any donations that were, were made between then and, and the 10th of March. So if you're up for donating, uh, your donation will be doubled automatically. Um, and we have some nice perks. If you take the cover price of the book and add on 20 bucks, it really helps us out, and um, you'll get a signed copy of the book right when it comes out. Uh, we, uh, we do an online course, and you can uh, donate and sign up for that course. Also get a signed book. Um, there's a couple other perks on there as well, so you can check that out through our book website. Um, the goal of this Kickstarter is, is uh, to compensate and support the many contributors. I had um, writers, researchers, farmers uh, put time and energy and thought into, the, into parts of the book, and I want to support their work. Um, I, in the process of doing this book, collected all these valuable resources. So they're sort of sitting on my computer hard drive and I really want to organize them in an easy to access fashion. So that if someone is interested in specifically civil pasture and orchards, well, we can kind of pull upon that pile of information. And that takes some time and resources to, to functionally organize that into some kind of library. Um, and I also want to do a number of audio interviews. There's a number of really interesting folks who have voices in the conversation that I want to bring to the table, and I think it's a good supplement to the book. And so um, this, along with another online course that is a, is a guide to, that helps folks walk through the book and work on a design for their property, these are the, the outcomes uh, if this Kickstarter is successfully funded. We're doing pretty well, but I can use every, uh, everyone's help, no matter what you can give. So I'd appreciate you considering that, and also... Um, 
um, sharing this uh, information with other folks as we as we move forward here. So that's my pitch. Let's get into the content for today. I'm going to start off and um, and outlay a bit about civil pasture and talk specifically about our farm. This this uh, interest in this really comes from a very direct experience that I've I've had as we've developed our grazing system on our farm in New York. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Eric, who's going to give us the the bigger picture and sort of the the climate implications of silva pasture. Um, so, the way I define silva pasture is the uh, intentional combination of trees, domesticated animal, and forages. I like to focus on it being multi-layered, uh, and where each part, each of those parts, the trees, the animals, and the forages, really benefit from their relationship to one another. And we really strive for design that creates multiple yields off the same parcel of land. Um, as we'll talk about more with Eric, silvopasture has, has a great promise in being one of the best forms of regenerative farming. Um, it can do a lot for soil health, it can do a lot for wildlife habitat, and it can bring the highest amount of carbon um, back into, into the ecology of our landscapes of any farm system. And Eric's worked on this project and, and, and I'm gonna let him explain the details, but uh, silvopasture ranked quite well in this recent publication of Drawdown and I was really excited to see that and really makes sense on a lot of levels. So big motivation here for getting this uh, practice out there in the world and, and into more people's hands is, is recognizing its implications for, for this real big challenge that we're faced with. Um, uh, on the home front, on the, on the farm front, I, I also recognize that it's got to sort of work out for the farmer on the day to day. Um, and this has been one of the challenges uh, as I've worked for Cornell Extension and other avenues, you know, uh, folks care about climate change, but they also have to think about their bottom line. They have to think about their own ecosystems on their farms and how they're going to manage them. So silvopasture also offers this whole range of benefits, you know, specifically to the farm and um, to farmland. And uh, we get into great detail into that, um, into the book. And, and there's just kind of different, something for everyone here. There's a real buffet of opportunities um, in silvopasture. Um, I want to emphasize, and I get into this a little bit deeper in the last webinar, if you want to revisit that, that silvopasture is not just putting animals into the, into the woods. Um, it is um, intentional, it is designed, uh, and it, it, it is really managing the tree layer, the forage layer, and the animal layer. Uh, and so we have a legacy and a history, and a lot of people say, oh, I, I do this, uh, I got pigs in the woods all the time. And if you're just throwing animals in the woods, it's really not silvopasture, and it can actually be uh, very contrary to the types of benefits that we're talking about um, in this presentation and other presentations. So I really think about these three things and actually really four things. The farmer is an orchestrator, is a, a, a facilitator of these dynamics over time. And so we, we have to look for ways to uh, support all these layers and, and recognize that each must benefit. So if it's just the animal that's benefiting from shade, I wouldn't call that silver pasture. Really want to see the diversity and the health of forages. The health of the trees um, and, and, and of course the farmer as well all benefit from the from the system. So silver pasture can take two different uh, approaches and it's pretty interesting because really arguably you could do silver pasture on um, any piece of, of land um, and uh, so we could go uh, from one angle here on the on the left side is, is what we call woodland conversion where we take a woodlot and, and again we don't just throw animals in it we actually I have to do some thinning, uh, pretty dramatic thinning in many cases to get enough sunlight to hit the forest floor to establish good grazing forages. Um, and we can also establish trees uh, in pasture uh, and bring animals in in that system. And they're, they're quite different, they're quite dynamic. And the interesting thing about silvopasture is how context specific it really becomes. Uh, there's no way to design a silvopasture that's a blanket recipe for every landscape. Every landscape's a little different and we have to take that into account as we go along. So you can see at our farm here, with silvo pasture, we consider kind of just one of all the different agroforestry practices. Um, we don't really have alley cropping in our system, um, but we do these other practices that are named by the USDA um, that work on different aspects of incorporating trees and woody perennials into the landscape have all uh, found value in our farm. So the forest farming blob there, that's our sugar bush where we do tap for maple. We raise, uh, we, we, we do mushrooms. Uh, the ducks sometimes hang out in there, but the sheep don't go in there. So the areas in yellow are all established silvopasture or silvopasture in transition. 
Um, and you can see there's some gaps there where it's open field and, and in, in future years, hopefully we'll bring trees into that as well. But, you know, agroforestry really is a broader term that I think is important when we're looking at landscape and recognize that silvopasture is just one of those, one of those many strategies to go. So from my perspective as a farmer, um, I'm, I'm concerned about climate change, very much so. Um, but on the day-to-day -day or the season-to-season, -season, the things I'm often thinking about are very specific uh, effects of climate change, right? So um, I'm concerned about flooding on our farm and what that could look like. And that was actually the first challenge we encountered on our farm landscape. Um, uh, just a couple of years ago, and I'll talk about this specifically, I, uh, we, we experienced historic drought that had never been seen before. And so I'm concerned about how to address that. And, and within that often are exceedingly hot temperatures. You know, growing up here in central New York, we didn't really see many days go into the 90s, and that's more and more of a common experience. And what I notice in our livestock is, is a lot of stress related to that if they're out in the hot sun. I'm concerned about winter storms, uh, and I think we often think about uh, stress being in the summertime, but especially in colder uh, climates, we got to think about the winter as well. And so if our animals don't have shelter from driving winds and snow, um, it can really adversely affect um, you know, uh, maintaining good healthy weights, their overall health and nutrition, um, and certainly lambing and birthing, uh, calving if you're doing cows. I'm concerned with winds. We have a very windy site. And I am concerned, and I know our customers are as well, with the ecological footprint of our products. So I, I, uh, there's an incredible resurgence and in interest in grass-fed meat. And I want to take that to the next level. I want to talk about tree-fed or, or uh, tree-based systems that, that produce meat, right, uh, or dairy products or something like that. And I think that's an important part of it. Consumers are interested. Grass-fed meat alone is doubling in its demand every year in the U.S. Um, and so we could bring silvopasture right into that conversation. And that's an important marketing edge, you know, uh, for us uh, as we enter markets with our, with our farm products. So with flooding, um, this is really what we focused our farm design on first. Uh, one of the statistics we looked at, this is a summary that shows an increase in the top 1% of rain events. So that's kind of the, the heaviest rain events that we could have in our region. I think of those often as three or four inch rain events. I mean, we are seeing across uh, many of the, the cool temperate climate um, a drastic increase in these. And, and I can say anecdotally that for the past few seasons, most of our rain is coming in you know, one inch or greater events. It's a, it's a pretty extreme thing. Um, and so we wanna think about how to mitigate that and work with that in the landscape. And when we encountered our farm, that was, that was the main challenge we could see and feel very visibly. Uh, the water problems were so bad that we actually couldn't even move from field to field. We couldn't even get up our driveway. Um, we had to park and walk up a mud slick because it was so bad. And so we had to do a lot to work with the hydrology and also come up with some creative solutions. Um, and silvopastures fit so nicely into this, uh, this set of solutions. So part of this process, of course, is mapping and really understanding what's going on. This is a map that we did early on that looked at our landform, which would be aspects of topography and how the land is shaped and where water might flow. And we mapped out, you know, areas that we observed as being excessively wet. Uh, we mapped out our, our creeks and whether those are vernal and they, they ebb and flow or they're consistent. Um, we looked at our contour and really thought about um, where the water wanted to flow as it, as it left the landscape. Um, and that led us to a lot of different solutions, a lot of different decisions, building ponds, putting in swales. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, this is not a process that happens in just one season, but something that I think is at least a, a three to five to, to maybe greater um, time scale, depending on the scale of your project and, and what your, your, your goals are. So just some examples here. Uh, early on, we dug a swale um, that, that sort of connected two watersheds. Swales are uh, a ditch along contour. An easy way to say, a, a better way maybe to name a swale is a, a Berman Basin. So we have the basin, which we cut out here with an excavator, but you can do these on a hand scale and we mound that material. Uh, and so we're cutting this across the hillside, across contour, um, actually with a slight drop. And so where this uh, originates is a pond. And so the overflow from this pond fills into this swale and then it's carried across over 300, 400 feet across the landscape. And the, the berm is, the basin, excuse me, is designed to hold the maximum amount of water that could happen. So there's some math and some calculations involved to figure out what that could look like. So in a four inch rain event, the pond's gonna overflow. We're also gonna get a lot of surface runoff from our fields. And we want this to collect in a space where it can be managed rather than 
what we experienced early on in our farm was water kind of going everywhere or pooling in places and, and creating soggy wet spots. And from a pasture management standpoint, that doesn't do us very well because um, grasses don't tend to persist very well in standing water if it's frequent or it's hard to drain. Um, so we wanted to even out sort of the, the flow of water. We wanted to put water intentionally where we could use it best. And water um, is, is an important feature if you want to grow trees, of course. So, so we're, we're kind of knocking a couple birds with one stone here where we're, we're managing water in our landscape. We're also creating this wonderful planting space. This berm here um, becomes a great space to plant trees. Um, it's nice and, and well-drained and high up. And yet the roots as they grow down can, can get into that sort of water table that we've created with the basin. And so when you do have those four inch rain events, it basically becomes a, a passive watering event. So here's some folks, it's, it's nice to do your, if you're doing these on larger scale, it's great to do it with a machine, but of course you always need some hand labor. You can see here some folks helping shape the, the finished swale and there is some, um, in the previous slide we showed a laser level there. There's a lot of leveling to do, especially if you want it to drain uh, slightly, which usually you do, at least in uh, so, uh, heavy clay soils. Um, and you can see there a bucket on the right with uh, with some willow stakes. And so this is our tree planting material. And I absolutely love willow. It's it's become one of our favorite silvopasture pasture plants. We'll touch on it just briefly today, but the next webinar we're going to offer, I'm going to really dig deep into tree fodders. Um, and the reason we planted it at this point, we didn't even know we were going to have grazing animals. We planted it because it was cheap. <laughs> we could get this material for free, cut it into 12 and 18 inch lengths and pound it into the ground with a rubber mallet and but voila, you have a tree. Um, if only all trees were that easy to propagate, but unfortunately um, that's not the case. So in this case, we were looking to build a windbreak and get something going there. And it was a, it was a real success. And, and it's, as you'll see, uh, really benefited our livestock kind of unintentionally. So here's a swale after a four inch rain event, pretty much scaled to capacity. The swale there is the, the, the berm, I should say, which is downslope or to the left of the water is, um, is planted with willow and cover crop. And, um, and so you can see in these major rain events, instead of all this water uh, rushing down the hill, uh, sogging up our pastures, uh, we were able to control its, its release and its ability to soak into the landscape more naturally and the, the sheep are grazing just below it there. Um, so we talked about willow. Again, willow is kind of wonderful benefit of being able to be planted and, um, and to sprout. Um, and here's a shot in the winter of the willow. This is just three years after establishment. So those, each of those individual stakes pounded in became a six to eight foot tall uh, shrub, you know, uh, pretty, pretty successful windbreak um, and pretty successful planting after just about four years. So that's flooding. Um, I think there's interesting combinations that can happen with different earthworks, as we would call them. Swales would be one option out of many that could be combined with silvopasture. But, you know, we designed our farm and really looked at this, this problem of over, too much water. We didn't actually really consider the, the problem of too little water. And this is going to be the, the, the flip back and forth of the, the pendulum as we, we experience climate changes on our, on our farms. So this is a picture from September of 2016. We, have, we were really proud of ourselves. We really felt like we had a good flood-proof site going, and, and then this, this drought hit, and it was historic drought. This is um, considered extremely severe, uh, and, and it was, uh, for us, kind of biblical because we, we got our sheep around the rotation. Uh, we move our sheep every two days, two to three days. Got our sheep around one rotation of our farm. We came back to the first paddock, and there was no grass. There was nothing to, to feed them on. And it was a mad scramble. Anyone that had livestock either was selling livestock or buying up feed wherever they could get. And so feed prices spiked, whether that's hay or grain. Um, uh, panic was certainly at an all-time high. The stress on farms is really big. Um, and, and it was a real challenging year. It wasn't anybody's favorite year uh, to farm. We had picked a, a breed of sheep that uh, when we went through the criteria and we looked at the possibilities, we, we kind of made that laundry list and then made some really careful decisions about who we wanted to involve uh, in our farm. And one of the reasons we picked Katahdins, which is the sheep we work with now, is because of their propensity to basically act somewhat like goats. And so we, we had heard this and we'd observed it from the farm we bought them from, that they actually are, are preferable browsers. Um, so sheep have quite a range. Some really like to do grass and, and some are more interested in woody stuff versus goats who really like the woody stuff preferentially. Cows really generally like grass very preferentially, but they'll often also graze a little, a little brush. 
So this was a real rubber hits the road moment where we said, okay, we have, um, we actually calculated all the edges and scrubby land and stuff that we hadn't even looked at because it was so inaccessible because it was so overgrown with stuff. We looked at that as an opportunity to see what would, what it would look like to get the sheep in there. And we actually added it all up and it was over eight acres of pasture that had all this vegetation that looked great in the drought, frankly. And we, we put them to work. We let them in and, um, and they did a phenomenal job. They lived for the, that 40 days off of just brush and, um, and their weights were no different uh, when, we, when it was time to harvest some of them for, for the season. So pretty remarkable. Um, not going to work for every animal and every species, but we kind of lucked out in that. Our, our friends who have dairy sheep up the road had to buy hay, and it, it really cost them a lot to recover from this drought. Um, that willow swale, here it is, came into play as well because the brows of that willow became just high enough for us to be able to get the sheep in there. And you can see the berm itself creates this raised... Um, uh, topography from the pasture, which actually keeps them from being able to access too much of the upper branching of the willow. So what's great is they were able to strip the leaves and benefit from that without actually um, damaging the tree so much that it would be knocked back or killed. Uh, and so this was a huge food source for them. And then we also later learn, and I've learned through much more research in devel developing the book, that willow is really high in tannins. And so we're, we're not only feeding them good, uh, good edible food, that's nutritional, I should say, but also medicinal. And so tannins, high tannin content has been associated with, with parasite uh, control in small ruminants. And so there's a real benefit to having this as a feature in the landscape. In extreme heat, you know, we were able to provide spaces, you know, our ducks are basically wearing a down jacket at all times. And so having them, um, you know, in a down jacket in the hottest uh, weeks of the year is no good. Um, they tend to hang out under the house. They don't do much foraging. They're not very interested. They're not very active if they're out in the sunny pasture. So we bring them into the forest. And we've had to think a lot about how to, again, cultivate that forage layer, bring them into the, the fold of the system. But they really benefit from comfort. And so with drought often comes this heat. Um, our sheep were the same way. You know, this was during that season. Um, they, if, if you've worked with livestock, anytime they have access to shade, even if it's 75 or 80 degrees, when they're ruminating, they're going to want to go into some place and, and take a chill break in, in a cool space. And so this is something that is, is going to happen if they have access to it. But we can more intentionally cultivate this. So my critique of my own photo here is we haven't really cultivated the forage layer. And, and in order to cultivate the forage layer, what we need to do is thin that canopy a bit, get more sunlight in there, and establish some of those grasses. Right. So the benefits are here. Um, we can see them observable in the landscape. We can see them in the research. And, and it's all become part of this conversation. What we realize is that silvopasture, in putting it into practice, really creates a resilient system for us that um, can deal with either of these extremes, can deal with extreme rain events and deal with extreme drought events. It was really fun to feed our, our sheep honeysuckle, you know, which is something for years I've been removing. I've worked on environmental task forces and conservation groups, and we've been pulling this stuff out and saying it's the worst stuff in the world. Um, but our sheep absolutely loved it. And, and, and in the growing season, uh, in the drought, I should say, it really looks actually quite good <laughs> when there's nothing else going on. You can see the grass there in the background, completely parched, completely brown. So there's some value to these things. And, and while we transition to the trees we might want, we can bring our our, our, uh, our friends from the, the invasive species world into the mix, I guess. Um, so over time, this is a picture from last year, we, we see every harvest event or every thinning event as a feeding opportunity. So as we're opening up canopy, as we're making more space in these overgrown hedgerows, uh, we're giving our animals uh, a good bite to eat at the same time. And next, next week on Wednesday, I'm gonna do the, the last of these, this series of webinars on, uh, on tree fodders. These four species are something we're really excited about. They're, they're the best researched of all the tree species and I think have great promise um, in our landscape uh, when we talk about things like uh, flood control and also mitigation from extreme drought. And these things can grow extremely rapidly. And what's really cool about trees that grow extremely rapidly is we can get our silvopasture systems up and running really quickly, uh, relatively speaking. So maybe four or five years, as I mentioned with the willow before that's it's able to be integrated with the livestock. This is much, uh, much quicker turnaround than what people often think of when they think of putting oak or, or maple or some of the slower growing hardwoods, walnut into their system. That, that might take 10 or 12 years before you can bring the animals in. But these rapidly growing trees, which all of these would fit into, um, can also be integrated really quickly into the silvopasture. 
And they also are growing really extensive, massive root systems. They're accumulating carbon in their woody tissue. And so from a climate perspective, it's a win-win for both my goals as a farmer and also uh, for a changing climate. So you can see here in 2013, here's a planting and here's just a four years later where these trees are over 30 feet tall. They're, they're uh, turning into uh, valuable products, whether it's food for the animals. Uh, black locust is essentially nutritionally equal to alfalfa, um, rot resistant fence posts, um, and all sorts of other possible, possible products. So, you know, from a carbon sequestration standpoint, I can grow uh, trees, I can feed them to animals, I can harvest the posts eventually. This is after about um, eight years when these posts were harvested. This is Brett's farm up the road. Um, if I put these in the ground and I, or I use these in a building project, I've, I've successfully sequestered that carbon for, for quite some time. Uh, locust is incredibly rot resistant and these posts will last uh, decades um, before, they, before they break down. So 